Hi, everybody. Welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about language, text, and context as we study how to, how to uh, interpret Scripture. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study your word this evening, and we study the subject of how to study your word. We pray that you would bless us and give us wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to start us off by looking at Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26. The Bible says, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. So <clears throat> the Bible has been written by over 40 different authors, 66 different books on uh, three different continents. And today, with more than 6,000 languages spoken in our world, uh, the Bible has been translated into more than 600 lang of these languages. And um, <clears throat> we also can see that uh, that's the entire Bible, by the way. And then we have about um, certain uh, segments or, or portions of the Bible. Like, for example, the New Testament has been translated into, or, into over 2,500 languages. So there's still obviously a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of getting uh, the Bible in the hands of the common people. Um, <clears throat> but an estimated 1.5 billion people... Uh, do not have the full Bible translated into their language. So obviously, while there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, the efforts of Bible societies have, have ensured that 6 billion people can read the Bible. So we still have um, an estimated amount of 1.5 billion that cannot, uh, but there's about 6, um, 6 billion that can. Now, this is in contrast to the Dark Ages uh, in Europe, uh, when the Roman church was, was uh, in power and the Bible was largely suppressed and kept away from the, from the masses. And if you wanted to, uh, to know something about the Bible, it was expected that your priest would have to interpret it for you. The Bible was written only in, um, the, you know, the Bible was, was written in, in uh, Latin or, or translated into Latin and only the priest could read it to you. And entire services were conducted in Latin as if lang uh, Latin was some, some form of uh, holy language. Uh, and so then the priest could interpret uh, whatever what what each thing meant, and um, uh, educate the people as as uh, as far as his understanding would go. But thanks to the invention of the printing pe press and the uh, Protestant Reformation, this is no longer the case. So now instead of Bibles being chained to monastery pulpits and only written in Latin, the Bible is translated into the common language of the people as was originally intended. So if you think about it, Hebrew um, with, at the time when the the, the Hebrew prophets wrote uh, was the language of the time. And so, um, you know, um, there's some, some, I guess, countries that spoke uh, Aramaic, but the people uh, had access to understanding and knowing the Bible um, because it was written in a language that they could understand and that, they, and that they could read. If we fast forward to the New Testament, uh, Koine Greek was the language of the common people. So uh, when the Greeks took over uh, the then known world and set up that, that empire, um, many people spoke a common language. Uh, you know, they, they were, um, I guess, in some cases, forced to learn Greek, uh, given their circumstances. And as a result, uh, Greek would have been a common language, Koine Greek would have been a common language that people would have understood at that time and been able to speak. Or at least read. Um, not necessarily speak, but definitely to read. So let's look at... Um, how, how can we understand the scriptures? Are they meant to be understood? Are they meant to be um, read by the common person? And for what purpose? Why do we even have to understand scripture? Let's take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. The Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So according to this text, the purpose of the Bible, uh, was, it was given to us for doctrine, in other words, teaching, for reproof, uh, you know, to tell us when we're wrong and to put us on the right track when, when, we're, when we've gone astray, for correction, again, uh, dealing with the idea of uh, if we've gone astray, putting us back on the right path, uh, and instruction in right doing. And it's also for the purpose, so why give us this instruction? Why, why give us doctrine? Why give us reproof, correction, and, and instruction in, in doing the right thing? Well, so that the man of God can be perfect, 
and have all that is needed to do good works or to do what is good. So in order for us to do what's right and in order for us to be, um, you know, perfect in our, in our walk with God, um, the scriptures were given to us so that they could guide us in the right way. So the Bible um, was written as a witness to God's work in history, his plan for redeeming the fallen human, human race, and also to instruct us in all the ways of righteousness. So the Lord chose to do, to do this in human language, making his thoughts and his ideas visible through human words. Um, so in redeeming Israel from Egypt, God chose a specific nation, and he allowed uh, this, this particular nation to communicate his word through their language, which was Hebrew at that time, when we're talking about the Old Testament, and uh, maybe a few portions in Aramaic, um, which is a language that's related to Hebrew. <clears throat> and then eventually, through the rise of Greek culture, um, this brought a very new opportunity in allowing the New Testament to be communicated through the universal language of Greek. Uh, so remember that when the Grecian Empire, as I mentioned before, took over, um, people uh, largely adopted Greek culture and uh, Greek became a common language of the time. And so whereas anybody in ancient Israel would have probably spoken Hebrew or been familiar with the language, um, the Bible would not have been understood by the masses in terms of people who are outside of Israel. So uh, Hebrew and, and uh, Aramaic would have been great for people who live within Israel, but then, you know, what about the people who live far beyond those borders? Um, how would they understand the scripture? They, they obviously wouldn't have been able to. So much of the Old Testament would have been understood by the common person within Israel, uh, but not so much the outside. But once uh, the Greeks took over the then known world, uh, this sort of brought about a new opportunity in that when the Bible was translated into Greek, now it could be read not just by people who were of Jewish descent or descendants of, of, uh, of Abraham, but it could be read by pretty much anybody in the world. Um, so the rise of Greek culture brings this opportunity and allow the New Testament to be communicated through uh, the universal language of, 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 of the Greek uh, and widely spoken in this part of the world at that time. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint or the LXX, uh, would have enabled the apostles and the early church to spread the message far and wide with it with the with the with new missionary zeal after the death of christ so before they had just tried to travel the world uh with with uh, hebrew manuscripts you know people wouldn't have been able to understand that in their own native tongue it would have had to have been translated um but uh now that um the 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 new testament was already written in in uh in greek and uh the old testament was translated into greek um, by the time the apostles went to go and spread the message, uh, they were spreading it in the language that, that the people that they traveled to would have understood. So this is really significant when you think about Jesus's commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, um, you know, starting at Jerusalem, but making your way out uh, to all those other, to all those other uh, nations. So remember that the gospel was to be brought to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Uh, doing that with a Hebrew manuscript would have been pretty difficult. So the Bible had to be translated into the common language of the people, especially since uh, through the diaspora, you know, many Jews were in different parts of the world. Um, so reaching uh, people who were Jewish, who were um, dispersed throughout the then known world, and also reaching new converts who were, who were perhaps uh, of Greek origin or who were Gentiles, essentially, um, would have been easier when you had a, a, a manuscript that everybody could read. And so since Greek was, a com was the common language of the time because of the, the empire, um, this led uh, to uh, making it easier to, to spread the gospel since the manuscripts were, were, uh, were translated to Greek. So there were about the reason why it's called uh, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament is called the Septuagint is because 70 Jewish scholars worked together uh, to translate the Bible into the common language of Greek. Because remember that in many parts of the world, um, you know, the Jews had been dispersed uh, throughout the em throughout the empire. You know, remember that the... Uh, um, the northern tribes fell to the Assyrians and the southern tribes uh, of Judah uh, fell to the Babylonians. And so they were annexed from their land and, and, and um, dispersed throughout the nations. Uh, then under the reign of the Medes and the Persians, uh, many of them uh, returned to, um, to, to uh, you know, the, the promised land. And as a result, um, you know, there were still some families that were, that were pretty uh, widely spread throughout the world, 
Uh, so they so as people began to, to resettle and populate different different areas, uh, they needed a, 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 a Bible that they could read, uh, since many of them did not speak the, the, the language of Hebrew, uh, which would have been understood uh, by people who were native to the land of Israel. Um, <clears throat> So that, that gives us an idea of why the Greek language and translating the Bible into Greek was so important at that time. Um, and you'll also remember that uh, meant there were many uh, Greek scholars, uh, or so, not Greek scholars, but um, rather, uh, I think it was Ptolemy that set up a library. And he was looking for books from different parts of the world and, and ancient writings and, and even religious writings that he could add to uh, his library. And so uh, in doing so, he um, actually wanted... Uh, the Bible to be, uh, you know, translated into Greek so that he could read and understand this too. So, he, you know, he was interested in having different uh, literary works translated into, into Greek and, and, and brought into his library. And that's why, uh, you know, he actually offered a, a, a sum of money for people that could give him a, a manuscript or, or a book that he didn't have. Uh, and that's how a lot of uh, forgeries and, and false writings and pseudo writings came into, came into, into being. Uh, because people wanted that money, I guess, and so they would say, "Hey, well, we've got a copy of the Bible that nobody, or a copy of a of a manuscript that nobody else has." And oh, yes, this this should belong. This belongs in the Bible. Um, so people were actually encouraged um, through the financing of of, uh, of this library um, to come up with uh, works or books or literature that uh, were unique, uh, so that they could so that they could acquire that money. So it wasn't that um, you know. Ptolemy told people to make false documents. It's that in order to collect that money, which people felt that they needed at that time or that they wanted uh, to enrich themselves, they would make up false books or false or write under a pseudo name so as to um, just make a contribution and earn that quick money. Because after all, Ptolemy wasn't Jewish. How would he know? He wouldn't know. I mean, it's you know, so they, so you could earn so you can earn a quick buck uh, by by doing something like that without getting caught. And so that's how uh, many of those apocryphal books that people talk about were brought into being. Um, you know, people would would forge would forge documents in, in the names of, uh, you know, maybe a prophet or someone else and then say, oh, well, you know, here's a book, uh, you know, that that that's, uh, belongs in the Bible that nobody that nobody else has. Uh, you know, you, you may have uh, the, the canon uh, manuscripts, but you don't have this one. Um, so a lot of times that that's what would take place and how um, all those intertestamental books started appearing and people thinking that they were actually lost parts of the Bible. Um, and even today, people are still confused by that. You know, they think that uh, there are really books that are missing from the Bible uh, that, that uh, belong in the canon and don't realize that during that intertestamental period when Ptolemy was setting up that library, that people were um, encouraged by the money that was offered uh, to, for to falsify and to make forgeries of books. Sometimes, uh, you know, they actually legitimately tried to uh, write a book in the name of someone else. Uh, other times, um, it was, in, it was um, using a pen name. So choosing somebody who was popular from the Old Testament and using that, person as a pe using that person's name as a pen name so that one could get across their own political ideas and agenda without getting caught and possibly killed for making certain statements. So you remember, like, you know, in, in America here, we have freedom of speech, or at least um, to some extent we think we do. And um, because we have freedom of speech, you know, if you wanted to criticize a political leader or say something bad about uh, any sitting um, president or governor, you can do that, right? Um, but, you know, if you were worried about losing your job or, or losing, um, you know, maybe being thrown in jail for something that you said or something that, you know, if you were like a whistleblower or something like that, you might not want to uh, write something down under your name where people would know, okay, so-and-so wrote this, let's go and put, lock that person up, or let's hold them under close scrutiny, let's take them to court. Uh, so, so you would write under a pen name. Uh, you know, you might write under the name, like, you know, Mickey Mouse or, or uh, Hulk Hogan or something like that, uh, so that nobody knows who really wrote the, wrote, wrote the book. Well, they did the same thing during that intertestamental period, only they used the names of, of biblical prophets to, uh, to cover their tracks so that nobody would know who the true author was. But then over time, people started to think, oh, well, this book is supposed to be written by Jeremiah or by Daniel or by somebody else. So, um, you know, it must be a lost book of the Bible. So that's basically what happened during that intertestamental period and how, um, you know, uh, things got uh, out of hand and, and uh, well, not really out of hand, but, you know, that's how that's how all these additional books got added and manuscripts copied. Um, so while there was that aspect of things going on, um, 
translating books into the Greek language. And by the way, this is why many of those intertestamental books do not have Hebrew manuscripts. They only have Greek manuscripts. Because remember, Ptolemy wasn't necessarily looking for a, a, a Hebrew edition to the, um, to, the, to the work. He was looking for Greek uh, editions that you know people that attended that library could read. So he wanted it to be open for anybody to be able to read it or for himself to be able to read it. Um, so that's why, that's why the, the Greek language was so important. Uh, and, and so the great thing about all this that's taken place, in spite of that confusion that, that took place as well, but the great thing is that um, with the spread of um, the Greek language, it made it a lot easier for people to read and study the Bible, uh, even if they didn't have Hebrew uh, origins and, and, and maybe didn't even uh, attend or go to uh, the land of Israel. So um, <clears throat> let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 46 and 47. You'll remember that uh, the apostle John in Revelation 1-2 told us that he bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. And remember that in spreading the gospel um, now to the Gentiles as well as the Jews, um, they needed translations of the Bible that people could actually read and share. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46 goes on to say, And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe and to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not vain, a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. This text kind of shows us the importance of obeying all the words of this law for the children of Israel. Um, and again, you know, the law as um, this is this particular text comes from the law of Moses, but the law uh, translated the Torah uh, or in Hebrew is the Torah. Um, and the, the term Torah actually had different meanings. It can mean the first five books. It can mean uh, the actual uh, law of God, uh, you know, uh, or it could mean the. Um, you know, the, 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 the second law, the, the law that was contained in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so it, it, the, the term Torah actually had different meanings. But nevertheless, um, the Torah or, or the instruction uh, was provided to all the children of Israel. It was meant for them to be able to understand. And God points out in this particular text that we just read that it would, that it would prolong their days in the land that they were going to. Um, so... One of the important reasons why the law of God has to be obeyed is that through obedience, God would bless his people. And the same thing is true even today. When we obey God, he blesses us. And they would have, uh, and, and, and the children of Israel would have been able to live long lives without trouble from the surrounding nations. And, be, and they would have been able to remain in the promised land as long as they, um, as they, as they continue to obey God and keep his commandments. And uh, in addition, uh, they were also looking forward to eternity because they knew uh, that the plan of salvation, um, they didn't know, have all the details that we do today, but they knew that God was working something out uh, and that there was going to come a Messiah uh, who, who would set all things right. In the Old Testament, through obedience, they would be established and they would be able to uh, prolong their lives, not just uh, in terms of like the, the amount of years that they would live, but in terms of their stay in the land of Israel. Because as long as they were... They were um, they were obedient, they would be blessed, and they would be allowed, allowed and permitted to stay. But when disobedience took place, they would be cast out of the land. And, and God makes this, this point very, very clear in the book of Leviticus, as well as in the book of Deuteronomy, where he says, hey, the sins that I'm telling you guys not to commit, uh, all these commandments that I'm giving you, are all things that have been violated by the people who were here prior to you. So this actually isn't a list of, of laws and rules that are random. This is a, a list of things that the, that the people who inhabited the land of Canaan before the Israelites got there, these were all things that they violated and why God punished them and threw them out from their land and allowed the Israelites uh, to, to come in. And so God gave them these laws and these commands uh, to warn them that as long as they did what was right, uh, as far as these commands were concerned, they would be able to remain in the land. But when they began to become disobedient and to disregard this law, then they would be thrown out uh, or vomited out, as the text says, uh, just like the nations that were there before them. So God is, 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 is fair. Um, so obedience 
can prolong physical life, as we saw in the case of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had 15 more years added on to his life. Um, so, uh, and, and we can see, like, for example, that Enoch walked with God and the Lord um, took him, uh, you know, uh, from the earth. He, he didn't see death. Uh, Methuselah, who was his son, uh, apparently lived for uh, almost a thousand years. He's the longest known living person in scripture. So when we look at it from that perspective, obeying the commandments of God can often lead to longer life and living well. Now, the scripture here isn't just talking about a physical prolonging of a person's life, but also um, how they would be able to be blessed and remain in the land which God was giving to them. So, so uh, the actual text here says, um, and and He said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify you among um, which I testify you among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe and to do, all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life, and through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So they would actually be able to remain in the land, uh, unlike their predecessors, through the obedience to these commands. This also, by implication, would mean that they would have rest from their enemies round about them, uh, who were a constant threat uh, to try to take over their, their, their land and their territory, or to annex them in, in, uh, in many cases. Um, so they would be blessed and allowed to remain in the land without the, the trouble of these foreign uh, nations. God would bless them and keep them, uh, as, you know, as long as they as they were in obedience. But as we saw with, uh, you know, over time with the disobedience that, that uh, corrupted the nation, um, the nations that were around the children of Israel uh, were able to eventually overthrow them and, and, and keep them out. And sometimes God used the nations to conquer them at one point and to have them pay tributes uh, so that uh, they would realize their their need of God and their dependency upon God. But eventually, um, you know, in spite of the many warnings that God sent, um, you know, God used the, 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 the nation of Assyria in the north to overthrow uh, the ten tribes of the north in Israel. And then he used uh, the, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to overthrow um the, the two tribes in the in the south, uh, the, the the kingdom of Judah. Um, but if the children of Israel had been obedient, sorry, had, had been obedient, uh, they would have been prolonged in the in what in, in remaining in the land. Now the same thing also applies to us today, um, in that when we obey God, we have the promise of entering into. The promised land and of course we're not talking about jerusalem but we're talking about the new jerusalem we have the promise of being able to spend eternity with christ in heaven but if we are disobedient that brings punishment and death so we too just like the children of israel back then uh today we, we must also um obey god's law in order to live long and prosperous lives and also to be ready for eternity if we're going to remain in the kingdom God's law, his teachings, are our uh, surety and security. They are the only way that we can enjoy eternity uh, void of the many problems um, which shorten life or the quality of life. I think that the law of God is important. What you, you were talking about, John, that you know, he, he, would, he promises to save us, not because we keep the law, but because of God's love and mercy to us and grace. But... Um, I think that <clears throat> there's a lot there's a lot of ways I could go with this, but <laughs> but uh, I want to just go this way. Uh, let's see, I'll just try one or two or so, and uh, uh, let's see Psalms. I'm going to go to Psalms chapter 19 if you can come, turn there if you want to. Psalms chapter 19, and it says talking about the law of God, of course, and it says in verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. So, obviously, the commandments are even better than gold, much and much fine gold. And as it goes on, it says, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It's better than honey. It's better than the honeycomb. 
so it's better than your honey. <laughs> so the the law of God is so wonderful. It's awesome, and uh, just that uh, the law of God, and just that uh, His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Just that uh, Psalms, uh, the uh, Isaiah it was Isaiah. Sorry, Isaiah. Chapter 55, verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my, your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So he can save us without the word of God. He can save us with the word of God, but it's better to save us, that he saves us through the word. Because the the word, I mean, he can, he can save us if we don't have a Bible. He can still save us. He can save us through our conscience. But... It's better if he can save us the word because it's more direct. It's more. It's more clear. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Let's talk about um, the words and their meanings, right? So we've been talking about understanding the scriptures, and obviously, if we're going to obey God's law and we're going to do what God uh, requests of us, then we have to understand what He's requesting of us. So, in other words, if you just, um, you know, imagine walking to, into a room where everybody speaks um, maybe like uh, Spanish and you're the only person that speaks English. And the requirement is that everybody has to do whatever it is that you're commanding them to do, but you only speak English and nobody else there speaks English. They only speak Spanish. And so you walk in and in English, you start spouting off all these commandments and then you walk out and everybody's looking at each other like, what did he just say? Because they all speak English, nobody, I mean, they all speak Spanish, none, none, nobody in the room speaks English, and so in order for them to do what it is that they're expected to do, they have to understand it first. Well, um, scripture is written so that we can understand it. God didn't just give us a bunch of rules and commands that are so up in the air and, and, uh, and um, open to interpretation. Uh, you know, he, he, that, that wasn't the purpose of the Bible. The Bible was pretty straightforward in, in which we were intended to understand it and we were intended to comply with it. Um, and so obedience brings blessing. Uh, Andrew was right before when he was talking about how uh, we're not saved by the law, but uh, through obedience, um, you know, God blesses us. So sal salvation comes as a result of God's goodness and as a result of God's favor and his mercy, right? But his law allows us to continue in that grace and in that mercy because disobedience brings uh punishment or or incurs uh the wrath of god and so uh through obedience um we remain in the mercy of god uh it's kind of like how the children of israel got the ten commandments god didn't give them the commandments first and then save them it was actually that god saved them first and then he gave them the commandments because if you look at exodus chapter 20 the bible says i am the lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt out of the house of bondage so what essentially is god saying there i'm the one who saved you I brought you out of Egypt. Okay, so I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of bondage, uh, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And then he begins to list the other commandments as well. So the commandments are given in the context of salvation. And so the first God saves us and then he gives us his law so that we can enjoy and continue in that salvation experience. Whereas disobedience separates us from God. The Bible says, um, for your iniquities are separated between you and your God. Your, your sins have, have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So sin separates us from God, whereas obedience allows us to continue in the relationship with God. Uh, and it, and uh, the Bible also says that he who says that he loves God and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So the greatest way that there's a, there's, the scripture seems to equate love for God with obedience to God. So the best way that we can show God that we love God in response to his salvation is to obey him. So in order to understand what God expects of us, we have to read the words of the Bible. <clears throat> and if we're going to read the words of the Bible, we also have to understand their meanings. So in every language, there are words that are rich and deep in meaning, uh, and they are difficult to translate to translate adequately with a single word into another language. And so this happens very frequently when we translate the Bible into English, as well as the other languages. There are some things that don't translate exactly as they would mean in the original language. And so um, we, we sometimes will use more than one word to, um, to express the meaning of the word, or uh, sometimes we'll, we'll um, 
uh, you know, when you look back at the original language, you learn the deeper or fuller sense. It's not that the translation's wrong. The translation's still correct. But sometimes you learn a deeper and fuller sense of what is intended by the text. So let's take a look at 1 Kings 3, 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed me unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept him uh, this great kindness, thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. So this is David. So this is Solomon talking about um, uh, how he got, how he inherited the throne from from David, and that this was a sign or or a sample of God's compassion and mercy toward David. Uh, let's look at Psalm fifty-seven, verse three. The Bible says, "He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that that would swallow me up." God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. All right, let's now look at Psalm um, 66 and verse 20. The Bible says, Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Let's look at Psalm 143, verse 8. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Micah 7.20 Thou wilt perform the truth of ja to, to, to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. So from these passages, we see here that God shows um, um, the, the, the people present um, who, who, who were alive at the time that these things were written, uh, as well as the future generations, and daily um, his consistent and unfailing mercy. So the term mercy actually is repeated throughout each one of these texts. And uh, as we read what mercy means in each of these passages, um, we can see that it's something that would that would go to future generations. It's something that God showed on a daily basis, uh, something that was consistent and unfailing. The Hebrew word kesed, uh, which we translate mercy in our language, is one of the richest and most profound words in the Old Testament. So in other words, uh, we translate we translate the word mercy, but uh, the word mercy might not always have um, the complete meaning of uh, what kesed was really meant to convey. So no, don't get me wrong; it's not a wrong uh, interpretation to interpret it as mercy, but it's just that there's more nuance to it than just saying the word mercy. Um, now there are certain words that uh, like transliterate, like so for example, when they were translating Hebrew into Greek. Um, the word ruach got translated to panuma because they transliterated. They they uh, they were an exact replica. The same connotation, the same idea was embedded in both words. So when you have when, so when you're translating from one language to another, uh, sometimes it's great that um, one word transliterates because then you get the full sense and complete sense of the word. Now in some languages though, or even you know, uh, there are there are certain words um, that just don't transliterate with the exact same meaning. So sometimes it, it helps us, it helps to, to be able to look at those words in context so that we get a fuller sense of what the word means in its entirety. Uh, that's why reading the Bible with a strong con, with a strong concordance is very important so that you see uh, maybe a fuller sense of what those words mean and what they're intended to, to uh, convey or, or, or put across. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> the word uh, kesed or mercy is one of the richest and most profound words in the Old Testament. It describes God's love, his loving kindness, mercy, and covenant attitude towards his people. In a few passages that we that we've seen, uh, we we see him show great mercy uh, to to his servant David. Um, he continued in great kindness, which is kessed, uh for for David. In uh, as we saw in First Kings uh, chapter three verse six, uh, we saw in Psalm fifty seven verse three that he shall send forth his mercy, kessed, and his truth. Uh, and concerning Israel, he will give truth to Jacob and mercy, kessed, to Abram to Abraham. That was in uh, Micah 7.20. So the entire books, you know, entire books have been written about the word kesed, trying to capture the depth of God's mercy and love toward us uh, to, con to convey the meaning of that word uh, in the sense that it would have um, been understood in Hebrew. Now let's take a look at some, some, some other words. Let's look at uh, Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. <clears throat> the Lord... Uh, bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Now let's go to Job uh, chapter uh, 3 verse 26. 
I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Let's go to Psalm 29, verse 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And Isaiah 9, verse 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter um, 32 and verse 17. The works of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. So notice that in all these passages, the word peace is used. Uh, and the word peace that's used in each one of the passages that I read is actually shalom. So shalom actually has a lot of interesting uh, and different meanings. Uh, so for example, uh, that was often the greeting of how you would greet somebody in Hebrew. And I think it's even used in Jewish temples today, where when you want to say hello to someone, you would say, you know, shalom, or even to say goodbye to someone, the same thing. So you're actually saying to the person, peace. Um... So now this peace actually doesn't just mean peace in terms of the absence of war, but it has several different like connotations or meanings to it. Like for, so, for example, it can it can convey the idea of blessing, uh, peace, safety, quietness, rest from conflict, and assurance. So the Hebrew word shalom is often translated peace, but the meaning of the word is much deeper and broader than just this. It can be translated as wholeness, completeness, and well-being as well. Uh, Job's experience of trouble produces a situation where he has, uh, where he's not at ease. So he has no peace, he, nor is he quiet, or he, uh, he because he lacks shalom. He lacks the peace. And it's interesting that uh, when you greet someone on the Sabbath, the term that's used is Shabbat shalom. Uh, so Sabbath, Sabbath peace, Sabbath rest, Sabbath blessing, Sabbath completeness, Sabbath wholeness. It conveys all of these ideas together. So our communion with God provides the ultimate peace and wholeness that our lives desire. Next, let's talk about repetition, word patterns, and meaning. The, in Hebrew thought, um, there were a number of ways to express ideas or to reinforce uh, the meaning or emphasis of, of, of the importance of some concept. Uh, now, keep in mind that the Hebrew language does not contain any periods as the English language does. So when you write something down in English, when you want to end a sentence, you make a period. The Hebrew language doesn't have that. So the language structure developed other ways uh, to communicate such ideas or, you know, when, when you want to emphasize something like, you know, since they don't use any punctuation or, um, or exclamation points, uh, sometimes to emphasize something, they would often repeat things. Uh, so when you find something repeated two or three times, you know, it's pretty important. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 27. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, created he him, male and female created he them. So you see a couple of things repeated there. Like you see the, the, the word created um over and over again, and God is always the subject of, of, the, of the sentence containing the word created. Uh, and I think the word uh, created actually is um, bara. So uh, bara is a term that, uh, that's used in scripture that only has God as the subject, because only God can create from nothing. Uh, the word God is also, is also repeated. So God is the subject. He's the one who's doing all these things and takes the credit for doing all these things, and man is made in his image. Um, it's... it's uh, also repeated a few times that we are made in the image of God. So we resemble God, but we are not God. We are made like him. We are made to look like him or to resemble him in certain ways. Um, so in, in, uh, we are the image of God, but God is God. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of things are, are emphasized there to make the point clear. And even in verse 27, you know, it, it emphasized how man was created. So, so God created man in his own image. All right, so now we know whose image God, uh, man was created in. In the image of God, he created him. And then it goes on to talk about God creating the genders. Male and female created he them. So it's specific about who God created, what God created, and what genders God created from the very beginning. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sit upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you'll see there that the word holy is repeated three times to emphasize that God is holy. So the holiness of God stands out. Um, so the Hebrew writer often, uh, the Hebrew writers often emphasized, especially Moses, as we see uh, here in Isaiah, uh, uh, as we see in the book of Isaiah, the Hebrew writers often emphasize certain attributes of God by repeating things three times. Uh, the text in Genesis emphasized the unique importance of created humanity with the term bara, uh, which means to create, and it only has, and, and this term always has God as its subject. So only God has the ability to, or the power to create, and all uh, things created, all things that exist, are dependent and, um, upon God's creative power. Um, we also see that God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and there's this threefold repetition of the word create. Moses in this way, emphasize that human beings are created by God and that they are created in his image as well. And these truths were his emphasis. Uh, he, also, he also emphasized that uh, it was male and female that was created. Um, in Isaiah, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, as spoken in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, emphasizes that the holiness of God uh, and how, and how um, God's presence fills the temple and that he's unlike any other being. He's set apart. He's distinct from any other being. In fact, nowhere in Scripture do you ever find uh, the word holy um, put together three times like that, except uh, when it's in reference to God. And so it shows us that God is set apart and different from everything else. And even Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, for I am undone, when he comes into, uh, into contact, uh, seeing the presence of, of the Almighty. So when Isaiah is confronted with the holiness of, of God and the character of God, he cringes at his own unworthiness. So he becomes immediately aware of his sinfulness, in spite of the fact that he's a prophet and probably a, a, a you know a decent person by by uh, by human standards. Uh, in the presence of God, he becomes aware of his unworthiness. So long before uh, we have Paul's exposition on human beings' sinfulness. And the need for a savior, like what he had in Romans 1, 1 to 3, where he says, you know, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, we see um, this emphasis in scripture where, um, you know, God is set apart. You know, uh, the angels cry, holy, holy, holy in the presence of God. And we see how Isaiah becomes immediately aware of his own sinfulness in spite of the fact that he's a prophet. So the Bible gives expression to the idea of the fallen nature of humanity, even in a good person such as Isaiah. We also see, for example, in, uh, in the story about Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, how like in chapter two, you saw how uh, he had a vision of this image, um, which uh, was depicting the, the, successing, the succeeding kingdoms that would come after his kingdom and how God would set up an everlasting kingdom. Well, in defiance, Nebuchadnezzar sets up his own image entirely made of gold, representing the, the longevity of his own kingdom. And so um, in, in, in open defiance, uh, to that, we see the emphasis as as the story is described in Daniel chapter two, or actually uh, in Daniel chapter uh, three, uh, that the, the text seems to emphasize humanity seeking to make itself um, into a god to be worshipped, or at least um, to make its will superior to God's will, um, making um, human determination. Uh, more important than what God has already determined would come to pass. So in other words, when Nebuchadnezzar sets up the image of gold, uh, he's essentially defying what he saw in, in, the, in the dream in Daniel chapter 2. Because he, by making this, the, the image all of gold, he's saying, no, there's not going to be any succeeding kingdoms after me. My kingdom will reign forever, uh, which is an open defiance to what God said would, would take place. Um, <clears throat> so in looking at it like that, the fact that in this passage, we see 10 times that it's Nebuchadnezzar that set up this image. So the scripture emphasizes that this is Nebuchadnezzar's doing. This is him setting it up. This is his doing. 
um, and show and thereby showing the defiance or emphasizing the defiance uh, that he had to uh, what God had already re revealed would come to pass. So the point here in all these passages that we read is that the Bible emphasizes things through repetition. Uh, uh, you've heard me talk uh, before when we, when we spoke about prophecy, how prophecy repeats and expands, repeats and expands in greater detail. Um, so often things that are repeated are very important. You notice that Moses does that a lot in his, in his writing. Uh, there are certain ways that things are patterned. So, for example, you have the chiastic structure in, uh, in the book of Genesis and in many other books, uh, which serve to repeat and to, uh, and to, and to um, emphasize certain details. So next, let's talk about texts and context. So we've talked about like particular words, but now what about uh, the text and their context? Like, how do we understand them? A word has its immediate context within a sentence. And it is this unit that needs to be understood first. So before we can really understand much else, we need to understand particular sentences, particular words in the context of their sentences. Then there's the wider context of the overall unit in which the sentence occurs. So this might be a section of writing. It might be a chapter of the Bible. It might be a series of chapters or, or, or an entire book. So it's essential to understand um, the context of words and sentences in order to arrive at, uh, in, order, in order not to arrive at erroneous conclusions. So if you just take one word out of context or you, or you take, you divorce a word from a sentence or a sentence from its, uh, from its, from its paragraph or from its chapter, you can come up with all kinds of strange ideas because you're not reading the passage in its proper context. So first we need to be, we, we need to be able to find out, okay, what does the sentence actually say? What is being communicated? What, um, is a larger context behind the sentence. Uh, what's, so not just what's being, uh, what's being communicated in that particular line, but what's being communicated in the larger context of the chapter or the paragraph or the, or the, uh, the book for that matter. Um, so context is very important so that we don't go way left field and you know, get blown all over the map uh, with all kinds of false theories and ideas because we project onto the text what's not there instead of looking at the context. So, as an example of this, let's let's focus on Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-seven. The Bible says, "So God created man in His own image; in the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them." Now let's look at Genesis chapter two, verse seven, where it talks uh, gives us a little bit more detail. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, of course, I'm reading from the King James Version there. Now, there's a few things I want to emphasize here with this passage. Now, Genesis 2 isn't telling us about an additional event. It's actually describing the same event as what we saw in chapter 1. It's just that it's repeating and giving us greater detail to emphasize the specifics about how God did it. So in chapter 1, we just saw that God created man in his own image, um, but it didn't tell us exactly how, but in chapter two, it goes into great detail with how exactly man was created. Um, and so in chapter one, we saw that God created, um, um, you know, uh, male and female, uh, when he created man, right? So we, so there in Genesis chapter one, the term that's used for man or Adam is actually, uh, has the meaning humanity, right? So God created humankind or mankind. Uh, but now in chapter seven, it's talking specifically about Adam, the person, because it says, and the Lord God formed man or Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his singular nostrils, the breath, the, sorry, the breath of life and man became a living soul. Then as this, as the chapter continues, it goes on to tell us how Eve was created, that Adam was put to sleep. A rib was taken from Adam's side. God closed up the flesh instead thereof. And then uh, from that, that uh, bone that was taken from Adam's side, he made woman and brought her unto the man. And, and he called um, uh, her woman because she was taken out of man. So it goes on to show us how, not just how mankind was created, but how specifically the man, Adam, was created and then the woman, Eve, was created. Um, and it's interesting here that the, the, the Hebrew word that's used for uh, woman, Isha, um, literally means both woman and wife. So when God created Eve, he didn't just create a woman, he created the woman wife because the concept of the wife was embedded in the concept of, of, the, of the, 
of the woman because the woman and the wife are literally the same word and mean the same thing. So when God created Eve, he didn't just create a woman, he created a wife. Uh, and so for this cause shall a man, and uh, even that passage, I mean, I'm getting kind of ahead of myself here. Uh, but when you go down to Genesis chapter 2, uh, looking at uh, the biblical command with regard to husband and wife, um, the passage says uh, in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, when you see here the passage where it says, um, therefore shall a man, it actually uses a different uh, word for, uh, for man, meaning male. So therefore the ish, the male, shall leave uh, his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his isa. So the woman wife, and they shall be one flesh. So the, that was the biblical command and the, and the process for marriage, which God had set in motion as far back as Genesis. Now, another interesting point, uh, looking at uh, verse 7, uh, some people often take the word living soul or the words living soul out of, out of, uh, out of context. And they think that uh, Adam was given a soul. When the scripture actually doesn't say that he was given a soul, it says that man became a living soul. So human beings, according to the Bible, do not have a soul that lives within them, inside of them. The Bible says that God formed man from the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, soul actually here would probably not be the best translation of what is intended by the text. Because the two Hebrew words that are used for living soul are um, kahi and nefesh. So man became a kahi nefesh. Now, in this particular verse, in Genesis 2-7, um, it seems to be translated into English as living soul because the translators, I guess, interpreted it that way. But when, but when you see this word used elsewhere, its true meaning actually becomes even more clear. So man didn't uh, have a living soul put inside of him. Man became a living soul or a living nefesh. But what is really meant by this nefesh? Well, when you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you look at what was created, when we look at um, how the animals were created, for example, you'll see in Genesis chapter 1 verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. Again, using the exact same words, the kahi nefesh. So those two words together, actually you're talking about a living creature, not a soul that lives inside of a person. That was actually a mistranslation because of the bias, I guess, of the translator. Um, so really, when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, man became a living creature. Uh, so he didn't become a soul. Uh, soul would actually be a mistranslation or a misunderstanding of what's, of what's meant. Uh, in Hebrew, the nefesh, or the soul, was actually a, a living creature or a living person or a living being. I think living being would probably, probably be the best um, way of translating it. So uh, just as the animals were brought forth um, and God, when God said he brought forth the living creature or the living nefesh after his kind, cattle, the creeping thing, the beasts of the earth after its kind, he created all living things. Each thing is a living being. So when uh, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, he became a living being or a living creature. So you see how understanding words in their proper context is so important. So the word that's used for Adam actually had different meanings depending on the context. Sometimes Adam could mean mankind or humanity, uh, as we saw in Genesis chapter 1. Sometimes it was specifically talking about Adam. Actually, um, the Hebrew seems to use slightly different terms, or it's marked uh, slightly differently when it means Adam the person. So uh, if you look at the strong numbers, you'll see that um, Adam, as in like uh, mankind, usually uses uh, H120, whereas Adam, as in the person, usually uses H-121. And there were slightly different markings, but generally it looks about the same. Um, so the term Adam could mean humanity or mankind, male or Adam. Uh, and, you know, you can use the context of what's being said in order to determine that, or sometimes there are some markings that really pretty much indicate which one they're talking about. So looking at the context makes it easy to understand what's being talked about and what's intended by the author. So... We can see that man is defined within the context of, of, of this verse in, in um, Genesis 127, 
as uh, both male and female. So it's talking about mankind. Um, and so that's how it would be understood there. In Genesis 2-7, on the other hand, the same term Adam is used to refer to the forming of Adam from the dust of the ground. And this is before Eve was created, so there is no woman. Uh, so there we can see um, that the term Adam in that particular text, within that context, is talking specifically about Adam, uh, the person Adam. And you can see that Adam is a person uh, as it's affirmed later on in the genealogy. So when you look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 1, Luke chapter 3 and verse 38, you can see that Adam was a specific individual uh, who is uh, credited with being the um, progenitor, so to speak, of the human race. So just as the word Adam occurs in a specific text, so the context of, of the creation of Adam and Eve is found in a larger, cre in a larger creation account as is seen in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. So uh, the unit, in other words, the unit of text informs the interpreter of the additional themes, ideas, and the developments. So we can come to some gross misconclusions uh, or misunderstandings if we don't read the passages in their proper context to understand exactly what's being talked about and exactly what's being meant and how the word should be understood within the context of the sentence. Uh, people can take things way left field, so it's important for us to understand the words, what those words mean in the sentence, what the sentence means in the larger context of the passage, and what the passage might mean in the larger context of the book itself. So those things are very important when you interpret the Bible. And also uh, understanding the literary structures, like for example the chiasm that I talked about before. Because some people read Genesis chapter 1 and then read Genesis chapter 2 and think that the events of Genesis chapter 2 happened after the events of Genesis chapter 1. But when you understand what the Hebrew chiasm is, you, you understand that all it's doing is repeating and expanding the same exact thing so that it can focus or emphasize certain details. But in either case, in any case, uh, when we look at uh, all these chapters together, one thing that we get clear from the book of Genesis is that man and woman, or humanity for that matter, are direct creations of God, were made in the image of God, and after his likeness. And they were put together, um, uh, male and female, uh, to be the uh, progenitors of our of our human race. Uh, uh, thanks for having me on the program, John. I just want to talk about the rep, rep. I had something to say about the repetition and the meaning, the repetition word patterns and meaning. On Tuesday lesson, May twelfth, on page fifty nine, it uh, also the the Bible repeats itself, holy, 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 and stuff like that. But it also uh, shows many different ways of looking at the same thing. And uh, this is a familiar one for a lot of people in Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy, the blessings, Deuteronomy 28. And uh, let's let's look at that if we could, if, if we shall. And uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And it's interesting, the blessings here. It talks about the blessings on obedience. And it, ta it talks about all these different ways of you'll be blessed if you do this, you'll be blessed if you do this, you'll be blessed if you do this. It says... Uh, all, and all these blessings shall come upon you, verse 2, and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you, shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, and the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall you be, be your basket and your kneading bowl. So there's many different ways of looking at it. And Daniel does the same thing. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 11, it repeats, and then it enlarges, and it shows it in a little bit different, in a little bit different way. And But it's, it's trying to uh, emphasize the point, the truth of God's word. And in, in a way, in the, in the blessings on obedience, he showed it, God showed it many different ways of looking at it. But all, because, and then if, because if we are obeying the law because of love, if we do that, we'll be blessed in all these different ways. And it shows many different facets, many different aspects, many different ways of looking at it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. In addition to looking at passages in the context of their, um, you know, looking at the sentences, looking at the passages themselves, we also need to look at the larger context of the book. So you've got words, sentences, passages, and now we need to look at the larger context of the book itself. Uh, considering the fact that, okay, you know, these books were written in particular contexts, like, you know, they were they were written by particular authors that were embedded in a certain historical context. For example, the, the book of First and Second Kings takes us through the the um, the um, monarchies of, 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 of Israel and how those and, and what things transpired as a result. So we have our historical books like, you know, First and Second Kings or First Second Chronicles, 
uh, that gives us the history behind what took place. You have certain books that are compilations like the Psalms or perhaps uh, maybe even Proverbs. You have uh, certain books that are prophetic messages, so they're intended for a particular purpose. So, you know, the purpose of, let's say, the prophetic books may not be the same exact purpose of, um, you know, the Psalms, uh, you know, because particular messages are intended by the author. So depending on what book you're reading and who wrote it, it's, it has a particular context and should be understood in the context of the context it was written in. For one, another example, you got letters that were written by Paul to certain um, churches. Uh, those uh, might be seen as a little bit different from, let's say, the, the writings of the prophecies or, or the writings of the historical books or things like that, uh, because they were, uh, they were messages to particular churches to convey certain ideas. It's important to begin with the authorship and the setting, so knowing who wrote the book and in what setting did they write it. Many books of the Bible are assigned to particular authors. For example, the first five books of the Old Testament were written by Moses, and uh, many texts of scripture actually uh, um, cite Moses as the author of the first five books. Um, Jesus himself confirmed that Moses was the author of these, of these books, as well as the apostles who quote from it. So in other cases, there are some biblical authors that are not identified. So for example, we don't know who wrote the book of Esther. The book of Esther is about Esther, but it's doubtful that she herself wrote the book. Um, the, who wrote the book of Ruth? Um, or, you know, um, we don't know who wrote the book of, of uh, Samuel or Chronicles uh, because the authors are not identified. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, we, we know the time period that they covered and the events and, and what uh, important people lived at that time. When we look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 5, uh, Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 to 5 and Genesis chapter 22 verse 17 to 18, it's significant that Moses is the author of the book of Genesis because Abraham didn't write the book of Genesis. Moses did. But yet it contains the family history from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob all and then down to the children of Israel as they end up in uh, in the land of Egypt. And Moses is the one who's writing this history, which is significant because uh, in the passages that I, I, that I mentioned, Genesis 15, 1 to 5, and Genesis 22, verse 17 to 18, God makes Abraham a promise that he's going to have offspring, even though he didn't have anybody at the time that these promises were made, and that his offspring would be numerous like the sand of the sea. Moses is the fulfillment, is one fulfillment of that promise in the sense that Moses is one of those descendants. Uh, and the children of Israel, um, you know, who are in the land of Egypt, uh, fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham. Uh, that he would have many offspring, many children. And so when we look at it from that perspective, the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham wrote the book of Genesis, showing that everything that God had promised to Abraham came to pass. So Exodus through Deuteronomy were written by Moses afterwards. And of course, uh, you know, Exodus uh, would have had to have been written uh, after they uh, exited or, or, or had the exodus from Egypt. But Genesis covers events that take place prior to that, and so was most likely written first. So again, understanding the larger context of the author and the books that were written is very important to understanding what gets communicated in the book. Uh, so we have to take those things under consideration when we study scripture. But overall, I want to summarize what we've learned this week by, by saying this. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of God's will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. And so, um, as such, uh, Scripture is a holy book that we uh, need, to, need to take uh, seriously and understand and study uh, so that we can be in harmony with God's plan for our lives. Okay, so with that said, we'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing and being able to come together to study your word and how to study it and what things to take under consideration. Guide us, Lord, as we continue to study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great week.